to you this morning out of the book of Amos, but you don't have to like frantically turn there because I'm just going to give you my text as we get into the message. How about that this morning? Um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground as I as I talk about the book of Amos, and um, and so it's just too much to, to read today. I mean, I would love to be able to read it because then I could read it and only preach for five minutes, but, but uh, I think you guys would prefer if I uh, didn't read that great big long text there. So, um, but I, I sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, you know, you get into the Old Testament and, and let's just face it, I've been in ministry a long time, but some of these books are pretty boring. <laughs> You know, I mean, they're prophets, and they're kind of wild and crazy, and, and you know, if I met somebody like that on the street today, I'd probably call the cops. I, I uh, You get into the genealogies, and, and it's so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so, and it's great if you've got insomnia, and you want to go to sleep, you know, you pick, pick up Leviticus and start reading, and five minutes later, you're, you're snoring, you know, and... And I'm just being honest, and I'm just being real here today. So when you hear me say that I'm going to speak out of the book of Amos, I'm sure you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, this is another one of those minor prophets in the Old Testament, and, and how in the world is he going to say something that's relevant to us today? But let me, let me just kind of get you to think with me for a moment. We live in a society where we have Facebook and Twitter and social media, and we got photocopy machines, Xerox, you know, all of those things that we can do. But back when Amos was, was teaching, they didn't have any of that stuff. The only way they could record what was preached by the preacher is they wrote it down. And can you imagine you're in a service and Amos is, is going and the anointing of the Lord is on him and a, and a guy raises his hand and says, hey, uh, Pastor Amos, can you go back over that? I didn't get it, you know, and he's writing it down. It's not like it's something that's recorded. In my lifetime, I've seen us go from reel to reel to eight track. You remember eight track? Yeah, you know, I had a 72 Nova with an eight track player in it and I was like rocking it. And then we went to cassette, you know, cassettes were great. And, and I bought all these books on cassette and now I don't even own a cassette player. And then we went to the floppy, you know the floppy disk that you stick in the computer? I remember when computers had only four megabytes of memory. And now we got cell phones that have a 10-story building worth of computing power in a cell phone. But they didn't have that in Amos' time. So it's safe to, 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 to assume that if after all these thousands of years, we have the recorded word of Amos... And it's been re-recorded and copied and, and carried down through all these centuries. That is pretty important to say, right? It's pretty important words. It's pretty important for us today. And there's a few things I want to tell you as we begin Amos. I, I, I like to give you my points up front. And that way if you check out on me in the middle of my message, at least I got my point across, right? I mean, there's four things I want you to know today. Number one, God has a message for us. You know, all throughout this chapter in Amos, he's going to say, thus saith the Lord. And Amos is not just doing that just so people will, will think that Amos is speaking for God. Because that's a responsibility that, that Amos probably didn't even want. But it is indicating that it's not Amos' words. It's God's words. God has a message for us today, and, and, and I don't want you to think for a moment that what I'm saying is what Timothy's saying. I'm trying to, I'm going to try to stick as close to what Amos says as possible, and I'm sure Amos tried to stick as close to what God said as possible. But not only does God have a message for us, but God will use whatever he can to get that message across. God's pretty creative. In, in the way he delivers his messages sometimes. And then the third thing I want you to know is that God would like to recreate his DNA in us, his values, the things that he cares about. And last but not least, and though, though God can often be upset with us, and although God can often discipline us, God loves us and makes a way for us to prosper. 
After that time of discipline, after that time of him dealing with us, he makes a way for us to be restored. He wants us to be restored. He wants us to have his DNA, and he wants us to walk in newness of life with him. So these are the four things that I want you to understand. And as I turn to Amos, the first chapter, and, and you can just follow with me. We'll get to the text in a minute. I, I want to start off by reading in, in verse number three. Wait a minute. Somebody changed the size of the font in my Bible. It says, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Now, I want you to imagine with me this morning that we're in a church in the deep south and Brother Amos is the pastor of that church. OK, and Brother Amos starts off his message by saying, he says. For three transgressions and for four, I will not turn my wrath away from Damascus. Well, if you were an Israelite during this time, you would know that Damascus is the capital city of of Assyria, the hated enemy of Israel. And I mean, here comes the prophet and he steps out on stage and he starts preaching against our enemy. So what are we going to do? We're all going to raise our hand and go, Amen, Brother Amos. We're going to shout, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Finally, somebody's preaching against those people from Damascus. And we're going to get excited. I mean, if you're in a Pentecostal church, there's a sister breaking out in the back with trembling going on. You know, if you're in a Baptist church, all the deacons are nodding. You know, I mean, I mean, we're, we're getting excited because Amos is preaching about Damascus. And then Amos goes on and he says, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn. That's the Philistines. I mean, that's the people that, that, that David fought against, that Saul fought against. I mean, these are the hated enemies of Israel. I mean, revival's breaking out. Even the back row is saying amen. I mean, preach it, Amos. Go, Amos. And somebody looks at the person next to him and goes, isn't this the greatest message you ever heard? Because they're talking about Damascus and Gaza. And then he goes for three transgressions of Tyre and for four. This is the Phoenicians. These are the people that, that Solomon had a covenantal agreement with. And they went back on that covenant. So they are traitors. Amen, Amos. Boy, a sister gets out her handkerchief and is waving it. Glory, hallelujah. We're going to do a victory march because Amos is preaching against Damascus. He's preaching against Gaza. He's preaching against Tyre. And he goes on and he talks about Edom. Man, the Edomites, those people that are actually blood related to us, but turned on us. Those Edomites. Amos is got them whipped up into a frenzy. He goes on and, and, and he talks about all of the enemies of Israel. Moab. He talks about Moab. He talks about Ammon. And then finally he gets to a group of people. That you may know. He says, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away. Well, now he's talking to Israel, but when he gets to Judah, he starts getting close to home. All of a sudden, everybody's like, uh, Amos, what about Damascus? Let's hear that one again. Let's hear Damascus one more time. Let's go back over what, what God hates about Damascus. Because you see, Judah is people of the covenant. It's people that should know better. It's, it's, it's people that, that have God's covenant. It's, it's, like, it's like if we were here today, it's, it's like he's talking about the church down the street. And if he's talking about the church down the street, what happens when he talks about us. And sure enough, Brother Amos went there. And now I'm going to read my text to you. Amos says, in verse number six of chapter two, he says, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. 
They pant after the dust of the earth, which is in the head of the poor, and pervert the ways of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defy my holy name. They lie idle by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Boy, it gets quiet. The sister waving the handkerchief, she's patting her head. The, the ushers are, are getting ready to open the door for the mass exodus of people that are going to leave Brother Amos' sermon. Because Amos has finally got to the point where he's not talking about the people out there. He's talking about us in here. And you know, I use this analogy of a church because this is very, very much what the church is like today. I mean, when we come to church, we always love to hear messages about the folks that are out there. We love to hear about the drunks lying in the gutter, the drug addicts. We love to hear about the people that are, that are in sin that are out there. What we don't like to hear about is the sins that we commit. You know, we look at our pastor and we say, oh, come on, pastor, preach against uh, homosexuality. Come on, pastor, preach against adultery. Preach against, uh, pre preach against those people that, 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 that murder. Preach against murderers. But what about us? What about the things that we do when he preaches on love your neighbor as yourself? We get quiet because Brother Amos has then gone from Damascus to Israel. And it gets serious in church when you talk about our problems. We'd all like to have some straw man that we can tear down, that we can, that we can speak against. But when, but when the rubber meets the road, when it's the thing that I'm not doing, you see, God has a, a message for us. He has something he wants to get across to us. He has a DNA that he wants to impart in it, and he'll use everything he can. He'll start in Damascus, and he'll get us on his side, and he'll come closer and closer and closer like a bird circling its prey until he lands on our doorstep, until he speaks to you and I. Now, I want you to notice something about all of these different groups that, that Amos spoke about that day. He spoke about uh, Damascus and, and, and the thing that they did wrong. Uh, I want to stop for a minute and tell you, Damas Damascus did a lot of things wrong. I mean, it was the Assyrian city uh, capital. It was a pagan king. I mean, they didn't worship the Lord our God. They, he, they did a lot of things wrong. He said for three trans uh, th three transgressions, yet for four. What he means there is, is you got a lot of transgressions. You know, you got a lot of things you're not doing. But there's one that you're doing that I can't forget. There's one that just really upsets me. There's one that doesn't, you know, there's a lot of things you're amiss on, but there's one that I just cannot tolerate. And for Damascus, it says that, uh, that they, uh, they, Threshed Gilead with implements of iron. Well, what does that mean? He's using an analogy here. You know, Gilead was a, was a neighboring country, the country that was between Israel and the area that was between Israel and Assyria. And, and, and the Assyrian army invades Gilead. But they didn't just invade it. They slaughtered. They cut off the people of Gilead like a threshing implement. They cut it off. It's like, it's like a whole country of people were, were destroyed. They, they, they killed the young men. They killed the old men. They killed the women. They, they totally threshed it. Like if you understand a garden, you understand that there are different kinds of plants in a garden. You can plant tomatoes and you can pick the tomatoes one by one. And you don't cut the plant off. You let it continue to live so it'll produce more tomatoes. But when you thresh grain, you cut it off and the grain dies and you harvest it. It's wasted. It doesn't grow another head of grain. It's finished. You just cut it off. And that's what they did to Gilead. And then you go on and you look at Gaza and it says because they, because they took captive the whole of captivity. Gaza, the Philistines would raid local communities and countries and they would take people captive and they would sell them into slavery. 
either into Egypt or, or into one of the other larger uh, uh, nations around them. They would, they would sell them into slavery. And, and then when we look at Tyre, he says, uh, I won't turn away your punishment because you delivered up people into captivity. Tyre was involved in the slave trade. And then you go forward. Edom was involved in the slave trade. Because you pursued your brother with the sword and you cast off all pity. What, what had happened is, is, is the king of Nebuchadnezzar had invaded Jerusalem. And, and the people in Jerusalem were trying to get away from the Babylonian army. And, and as they were making an escape, the Edomites cut off their escape. And using a sword, the Edomites struck down the people trying to escape Jerusalem. They showed them no pity. They allowed hatred and history to get them uh, to a point where they would strike them down. As you go on, you find that there are things like genocide, slavery, enslavement. You find that there are things like uh, feuds and there are lack of, of, of pity, lack of, uh, lack of care for their fellow person. Uh, on farther down, there's desecrations of people and so what, what God is talking about here is he's talking about a system of social values. And if these foreign people, these other people, if these people outside the covenant are expected to have the right social values because they have a common moral code, then how much more should people of the covenant have the right social values? How much more should those of us who know God intimately, who study his word, who look into his word, those of us that know, uh, how much more should we have his DNA? How much more should we stand up for what is right in our nation and in the world? How much more should we stand against these things like enslavement? We should stand against these things like genocide. We should stand against these things like lack of pity and compassion. And, and we should stand against these things like deception and destruction and desolation. It goes on in our world all around us because this world doesn't have the same DNA as God and it doesn't share the same common moral uh, code that, that, this, that God has. Then he gets to Israel and he says to Israel, he says, what did he say here? He says, because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. What's he talking about there? In Israel during this time, there was a disparity amongst the people. You had the haves and the have-nots. And often the haves would lend money to the poor to buy something as simple as a pair of sandals. And when the poor would buy a pair of sandals, if they couldn't repay, the haves would step in and they would take them. And they would take them into bondage for not canceling the debt. And the poor people were oppressed. And he says, he says, and they pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. They were so greedy. They were so consumed with the desire for wealth and, and to have stuff that, that even the little bit, even the crumbs, the, the dust that the poor had, they panted after it. They wanted it. They wanted to have it. And they devised schemes whereby they could get it. Lending them money for interest and, and putting them under obligation and, and using them to get ahead and, and to make money off of their backs. That was the sort of thing that was going on. It says, and you pervert the way of the humble man. A man and his father go into the same girl and defy my name. He's talking about young women that are caught up in the sex trade. He's talking about prostitution. Are you getting a picture here? I mean, you just look at last week's headlines and you can see what I'm talking about here. I, I, I looked at this and I'm like, uh, Brother Amos must have had a he must have had Fox News and CNN or something like that. 
because this is the headlines in America today. The Me Too movement. Oppressing women. The Me Too movement. The, the economy that's based on, on lending money and interest rates where guys on Wall Street get richer and richer and guys on Main Street get poorer and poorer. He goes on to say that, uh, that they lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. They don't even own the clothes on their back. How many of us here today are in debt? Credit cards, our homes, our cars. Amos has a lot to say to you and I. He's saying that this is not the DNA of God. This is not the way God expects us to treat others. Jesus came later on and he said, love your brother. He said, love your neighbor. Love your enemy. Love those that spitefully use you. Because Jesus had the DNA of God and he spoke these things. But you know, it's so easy to look at Damascus and blame them. And it's also easy for us to look back 3,000 years ago and blame Israel. It's also easy for us to say, hey, Brother Timothy, I don't do that. But what do we do? What would Brother Amos say to us today? Would he go and to Israel for three transgressions and before? But Timothy, for three transgressions yet four, what would he say to me? Would he say that the obligation and the burden that I place on my brother of unforgiveness and, and, and lack of pity and humility, would he look at me and say, hey, remember that missionary came through and he was taking up an offering for shoes, but you didn't give because you wanted a new car? I'm being real, folks. I've done that. I remember one time we were, we were in a meeting <laughs> and there was a missionary there and and they were taking up uh, an offering to buy him a generator. And the pastor goes, uh, um, he says, uh, how many of you here today will pledge $1,000, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> I start humming, you know, different bars of songs, you know. I'm on the Star Spangled Banner or something or another, you know, just humming. He's hoping, you know, he doesn't look in my direction. He goes, how many of you here will pledge 500? And he goes, how many of you here will pledge 100? Well, I was sitting on the front row because I was on staff and my wife was sitting on the second row. And, and I knew we didn't have $100 in our bank and we had some bills we wanted to pay and some things we wanted to do. And, and I turned around and I looked at Melissa and I said, write a check for $50. Now, I don't know how in the world she misconstrued that. <laughs> it's her fault, not mine. But he was on a hundred, right? So she writes a check for a hundred dollars. And there went all of our grocery money for the week. I mean, we're just poor church staff members. We don't have a lot of money. I think we had like $78 in the checking account or something. Other. I'm trying to figure out. So after we get out to the car, she says, I don't know how you expect to pay that hundred dollars. And I'm like, what? A hundred dollars? What are you talking about? I said, give him 50. And she said, he wasn't on 50. He was on a hundred. But sometimes we do things that show that we are in alignment with the DNA of Damascus a whole lot more than we're in alignment with the DNA of Christ. Somebody offends me and I hold them to that for the rest of their life. I'll never speak. The Bible says forgive, but don't forget. You know, the Bible is the most misquoted book in the world. My grandmother used to tell me that the Bible said, um, it says uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I realized Benjamin Franklin said that. She would come in and look at my room and say, Timothy, this room's a mess. You know, the Lord says... Cleanliness is next to godliness. 
But, but we do this all the time. Look at putting people under bondage and slavery, genocide. When we hear about something that someone did and we share it and we kill their character, we destroy them as an individual. We go on Facebook and Twitter and we pass along stuff that isn't true, that we haven't fact checked. We're destroying the reputations of people. They're living people. When we do these sorts of things, we show that we do not have the DNA of God because God calls us to have pity on those that are out there. He calls us to have mercy. He calls us to have love. You've heard of these things called the fruit of the Spirit. That's what He calls us to have. Long-suffering. Jesus says if someone asks you, to uh, walk with them one mile, go with them two. He expects us to have the fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering. People of the covenant. I really love this part where he says, uh, he says, they lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. I think one of the reasons why the church struggles so much with this today that I struggle so much with this today is because we have other gods in our life. We have other gods like materialism. All you ever see on TV, you know, it, is you see these commercials that tell us to get more and have more. One of the most liberating things that my family and I did when we went into missions ministry is we decided that we would only live on what we need. We don't need a bigger house. We don't need a nicer car. We just need what we need. And God will supply that need. We'll, we'll live within our means. And I quit a six-figure job to build Project Samuel. And I, I, I can tell you, um, I make a little money at, on a mission salary, but it's not six figures. But we've never gone without what we need. Americans don't know that concept anymore. I need a, a pair of tennis shoes that cost $120, you know. I, I need a, a car that, that costs three times what my first house cost. So we have this God of materialism that, that has entered even the church where we have churches that, that want to have the latest and greatest. They have, they have sound systems that cost more than entire churches cost 50 years ago. I'm getting somewhere, folks. I'm not trying to put us all under condemnation. I'm here to tell you today that there is one God. And it's not humanism. It's not materialism. It's not even Americanism. Where we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance more than we kneel for God. It's not that. There's one God, and he says, love those that are around you. He says, I'm a God of social justice. Reach the poor. I love what I, what I saw about your, your church's mission statement, reaching out to those in our community and our society around us. But do you realize there are a lot of people that are wasted candles? You know, a candle, whenever it burns and gives off light, it, it's consumed. The candle gets smaller and smaller. It, it's consumed by the light that it gives off. And when you put that under a bushel or you hide it in a pew, it's wasted. Eventually that candle becomes consumed and it's nothing and it's there and, and it gave light to nobody. That's not what God wants for his church today. What he wants for his church is to be the church to be that healing mechanism that goes out and, and touches the lives of people. I was, I was blessed to be able to be in a church service the other night where I heard a young man who was rapping and singing who just a, year, just a couple of years ago was involved in a gang and drugs and, 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 and was watching friend after friend die. And as he shared his testimony, I was like, that's the kind of guy we need to be reaching for. We need to reach Damascus, not criticize Damascus. We need to... We we need to reach out to the Philistines. We need to embrace them and love them and bring them in the church and see them change. But we have to be the church first. 
a lot of folks outside that, that door that you love to hear me preach at today. But, but the thing is, is those folks will never come into here until we get in alignment with God's DNA. We get in alignment with the love of a loving God that cared about us so much that he went to a cross and died so that we might have eternal life, so that we might be the light of the world. Having received that love, how much greater is it our responsibility to give it back to our community, to our city, to our nation? I have purpose this year I will not share in hate. I don't care what kind of hate it is. Racial hate, political hate, any kind of hate. Religious hate. I'm not going to share in that. I'm going to offer Christ as a solution. Yeah. Our world needs Jesus Christ. Yeah. Our world needs the gospel. Our nation needs it. Our political leaders need it. Everybody needs it. I need it. I want to read to you. Jesus says here... It's or uh, Amos says here at the end, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build up the waste and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine for them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in your land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord. He says, behold, the days are coming. You know, we want change. We look to Washington for change. We look to Pastor Scott for change. We look for, to Timothy for change. We look to Amos for change. We want change. We want a new day. But that day will never come unless we repent of what we're doing wrong and we get in alignment with God. But if we do that, then God promises blessing. He promises blessing on our families. He promises blessing on our communities. He promises blessing on our church. You know, our problems are not... What we think there are, the problems, the problems we have are in our heart. Getting our DNA in alignment with what God has, what God wants, what God expects. How many of you want a day in which in your own personal life the plowman overtakes the reaper? That means, that means it's producing so much that you can barely get the harvest out of the field before it's time to plant again. I mean, we planted a, a field in in uh, in Zambia. We plant corn every year, and, and in Zambia we don't have a lot of mechanized farming, so we we farm it by hand, you know. And and the plowman sometimes overtakes the reaper, but that's because the reaper is pretty slow, you know. <laughs> and I mean, we're over there. We're still harvesting days before it's time to till up and and prepare the ground because we're picking it off one ear at a time. And, that isn't what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is an abundance, an abundance of victory, abundance of the Holy Spirit, an abundance of God-given life in our lives. That's what he's talking about. That, that's not really talking about wealth. That's talking about the, the, the blessed things that are provided by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, think, that's talking about a lot of different things. I mean, I read that and the greed in me says, oh, I mean, I'd love to have it where, where uh, in my life I'm so blessed that the plowman overtakes the reaper. He's not just talking about that. How many of you will want God's blessing in your family so that your kids are saved? Yes. So that your grandchildren are saved? How many of you want to start a, a, a new generation of believer in your family, one that passionately serves God. There's a day coming in which that's possible. we got to get in alignment with the DNA of God. And it's about loving others. It's about serving others. It's not about holding people accountable and holding their feet to the fire, you know. And it's about freeing them. You want to free the people that are captive in your life? Forgive them. You want to free yourself to enjoy this blessing? 
embrace the DNA of God. Let me pray over you this morning.